Uh, welcome to the seminar. Uh, so before we start, we just have a, a little announcement to make, which is that we've just launched a new call for um, uh, your suggestion of um, speakers for following fall and winter. So don't hesitate to uh, send uh, us uh, suggestions. Uh, of speaker and uh, with that we're going to start so people on zoom as usual we're waiting for your questions in the q and a time and with that uh, thanks Frédéric for introducing to the speaker my pleasure um hello everybody thank you for attending this uh this meeting uh, this presentation um i'm very pleased to introduce uh, jean-baptiste Jouffre who recently moved to Stanford University at the Center for Asian Solution. And, and Jean-Baptiste is conducting research uh, about what Anthropocene means for the ocean. And um, he has a background, a very interesting uh, well, career, uh, young career, but still a very interesting career. He has a background in ecology uh, with a master in ecology from a Stockholm University. And then he continued with a PhD and a postdoc at the Stockholm Resilience Center, where he developed research um, which are at the crossroad between ecology, economy, sociology. And I, I actually discovered his work when I read um, a fantastic paper uh, entitled The Blue Acceleration, who was one of the first articles to really put figures, numbers on the increasing demand and pressure of human activities on the ocean. And this paper, I think, is well illustrating the, the original and uh, pioneering work of Jean Baptiste, which is uh, both interdisciplinary but also transdisciplinary. But I'm sure he's going to, to present you that in this field of philosophy in details. And um, I'm very glad he's here because uh, actually, as I said, he moved to the Stanford, but he had a workshop in Stockholm uh, this week, so he could come uh, in person, and so it's a great opportunity to have him here today. Um, so I leave you the floor, Jean-Baptiste. Well, thank you so much. 
uh, Fred, I, I wish you could always be the one introducing me because that's, <laughs> I, I don't know if you made those things up, but they sounded really good. <laughs> so, um, no, and also a, a warm thank you really to both Nicola and you for inviting me in the first place here and uh, reaching out and saying, why wouldn't you come and, and present your work? And we made it work. And I'm really delighted to actually be here. Um, I've been studying and uh, outside of the country for more than 12 years, so it's very exciting to, to be back um, here and, and to have so many of you in the, in the room and, uh, and online as well. Um, Fred said it, a lot of my work is trying to make sense of uh, what the title of this uh, slide is, the Anthropocene Ocean, what that is, uh, what does the Anthropocene mean for the ocean, but also what the ocean means for the Anthropocene. Um, and, and so focusing on kind of a holistic approach to ocean challenges. Um, and I really like usually to start presentation um, with that slide. Maybe some of you have recognized what that is. Uh, it's becoming more and more popular. It's, um, it's a world map, simply as that. It's, it's a map of the world based on the Spielhaus projection. And uh, Spielhaus, uh, Athelstan Spielhaus, his name, that's that guy here. Uh, he was an oceanographer. And in 1942, he, publishes, he published a paper called Maps of the Whole World Ocean, where he really argued that it was desirable to have the map uh, interrupted within the land masses and the world ocean shown as a unit. And so he drew the map to actually do that. As you can see, the consequences is like massive distortion of land masses as we know them. But what you're visualizing is one global ocean, which it is, uh, as a matter of fact, bounded by continental masses on all sides. So you can recognize Antarctica in the center, and then you have really the different continents split up. Um, I find it a very powerful uh, visualization of the ocean and quite a timely one as well, because I think there are two dimensions that jumps to you when you look at that. The first one is the interconnectedness of the ocean, how everything is connected. Like it's not like if something happening in the Mediterranean Sea just stays in the Mediterranean Sea or in the Pacific stays there. It's actually all connected in, in one ocean. And then of course there's the finiteness of it as well, right? And like when you stand on the shore and look at the horizon and see that, that ocean for miles and miles, well, uh, and you think like, well, it's endless. It's actually not endless, which means that everything that happens into that ocean, every activity that takes place, every piece of plastic that is done into it actually stays there and start filling it, that finite space of the ocean. Probably things you're well familiar about, why it is interesting on its own. Well, it's 70% of the Earth's surface. That's, that's a lot. Um, it's really important in terms of oxygen. Um, and it's an incredible source of biodiversity. So life in the ocean has existed for some 3.7 billion years. That's three times as long as life on land. And that means a far greater diversity of evolution. And I'm speaking to a convinced room here in terms of genetic evolution, among others. So out of the, the 34 major phyla, 33 are found in the ocean compared to only 12 on land. So you have that richness that's there and we barely know anything about it. Estimates think that you know, it's up to 90% of uh, marine species yet to be discovered. But it's also really important for the climate. Uh, it absorbs roughly one third of CO2 emission, up to 93% of excess heat. So this has been for decades now, the main buffer of the, of the global warming. And it's of course essential for circulation, whether it's the climate on its own or like marine and, and ocean currents that redistribute all that, um, all that evapotranspiration and deep currents. So really important um, for biodiversity, really important for the climate, but also increasingly important for the economy. Um, some estimates in terms of GDP, if the ocean was a country, would be one of the top economy in the world, the seventh one with a GDP up to $2.5 trillion. If you look at all the actual assets associated with the ocean industries, um, it's up to $24 trillion. So colossal in value, financial value of what, it, what, what the ocean delivers. It supports livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people, it creates jobs, it serves as a foundation for entire multi-billion dollar industries like seafood, tourism, shipping, we're gonna go into it in just a second. And that view of the ocean as a new economic frontier um, is fueling 
unprecedented hopes and expectations that it will be the solution for everything. And so if you look at a couple of headlines over the past few years, it's going to look like that. Could be the new gold rush. Uh, or it's going to tell you that it's going to feed the world. It's going to provide all the food we need. Or it's going to provide fresh water. Or it's going to reduce and solve climate change. Or it's going to be, you know, new medicines, new antidotes, new genes, new technologies, new communication cables. It's nonstop. It's, it's perceived, again, as that new El Dorado of things across a whole range of domains. And so we thought, well, let's try to synthesize all those claims, all those expectations on the ocean. And we organized them uh, for the sake of it across three fundamental needs for humanity, like food, material, and space. Um, you could think of also food, material, energy, and space. Right now, energy is, is weaved into material and space, but you could make it its own cluster if you wanted. And there on the side, you have what, what that may look like. So for food, it's of course direct consumption, it's direct seafood, um, but it's also feeds and nutraceutical. So you're using a lot of, of seafood to actually feed animals on land or increasingly things like omega-3 uh, to actually contribute to a rapidly growing market of nutraceutical. Materials, hydrocarbons, oil, gas, um, massive growth in the offshore oil and gas industry, minerals, uh, sand and gravel, among other, are the most mined uh, marine minerals. But there is, you've heard of it, the rapid progress and, and controversies around deep sea mining to go uh, very deep and, and collect some of the metals that are needed for technologies. Um, desalinated water, that's 65 million cubic meter of water every day that's being desalinated and that we're pumping from the ocean. Ornamental resources, genetic resources, scientific information. So it's also intangible material, like we, we know very little about the ocean and we keep learning. And then of course, space. And, <clears throat> and space is interesting because it has its own claims or use. Think of shipping and, and maritime transport uh, or pipelines, cables, tourism, but it also is needed for the two first one, right? So you need ocean space to get ocean food and you need ocean space to get uh, ocean material. So, it is becoming a crowded ocean. Over time, <clears throat> what does it look like? Well, that's what we call the blue acceleration. And that's very much in the spirit of the great acceleration. So the work by Will Stephan that kind of map a wide range of socioeconomic variables, um, starting like in, at the industrial revolution, but really taking off post-World War II. Um, think of global population. When, when my parents were born, there was like 2 billion people on the planet. We're, we're closing in on 8 billion, just over 70 years last time. Um, and so this great acceleration shows rapid exponential increase across uh, environmental um, variable, deforestation and things like that, but also socioeconomic variable. And it's, it's often considered as an iconic illustration of the Anthropocene. So like, what well, is the Anthropocene? Well, that very much is that rapid acceleration. So we took that and we thought, what does it look like? in the ocean. Um, and it looks very familiar, as you can see. This is a range of industries or uses of the ocean. It's not just a negative one necessarily. You can see marine protected areas there and um, skyrocketing as well. Do not ask me about the level of protection of those though, because otherwise it's a flat line. But it, there is a lot happening. And, and what it really describes is a new phase in humanity is that kind of exhibits a phenomenal rate of change um, over the past 50 years or 30 years, to be fair, but with a sharp acceleration at the onset of the 21st century. So the timeline is very different from the Great Acceleration. The Great Acceleration, it takes off in the mid 50s. Uh, the Blue Acceleration, it really takes off in year 2000, around there. And, and that there are two main reasons for that. First is the technological innovation. Uh, we didn't have the technologies to actually do a lot of those things. And then it's, of course, a stagnation and depletion of inland resources. So as we're running out of resources on land, we're increasingly moving towards the ocean. Uh, and this is perhaps very well illustrated by hydrocarbons, uh, where we're moving even deeper now within the ocean. Over the last 20 years only, these are the person growth increase, just 20 years. So since 2000, offshore wind farm, for instance, the global offshore wind capacity, it's a 51,000 person growth increase. Um, marine aquaculture, the world fastest food production sector today, 70% um, of the new discovery of large hydrocarbon deposits, oil and gas have happened offshore over the past 20 years. 
This is if you don't look at fracking, which is kind of remodeled the oil and gas landscape. But in terms of large deposits, most of them that we're discovering now are offshore. Um, I love submarine cables. So it's, it's 1.4 million kilometer of submarine cables that are at the bottom of the sea today. Uh, every time you have a Zoom call, uh, unless it's friends to friends, it goes through undersea cables. Um, they account for 99% of all international telecommunication. It's only one person that uses um, satellites. Submarine cables are faster, they're more reliable, and they're cheaper. So it's, it's the backbone of, of globalization today. Just over the 20 years, that's 1 million kilometers that have been set up um, at the bottom of the sea. Offshore wind farm, I mentioned it. Extended continental shelf is this beautiful article 76 in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea that says, okay, each country has an EEZ, exclusive economic zone, you know, sovereign rights on the resources, exploration and exploitation of resources, all the way 200 nautical miles from shore. And then they were like, but <laughs> let's write an article that says you can claim more for the seabed. And that's this graph here. So it's article 76 that says, if you can prove that your continental shelf extends beyond that 200 nautical miles, then you can claim sovereign rights on the exploration and exploitation of the seabed. So not the water resources. So it doesn't apply for fishing, but it does apply for mining. It does apply for deep sea mining. So it's, a, it's, it's critical. What you can see here are claims filed by countries over the world, more than 83 countries since the first one by Russia in 2001 to claim sovereignty over that extended continental shelf. In total, the area, that's 34 million square kilometers that have been claimed over the past 20 years. That's twice the size of Russia, the biggest country on earth. So think of ocean grab, right? We hear about land grab. I think there is a database of land grabbing. It's like the size of Texas. Here we're talking twice the size of Russia that have been claimed. Uh, France, among many, really stands to benefit from that. Um, and so I could dive into every single one of them. I would run way past the time. So I'm going to have to, to speed up. Um, marine genetic resources is also fascinating. We're talking 13,000 new genetic sequences that have been patented since the 80s, the late 80s. Um, the cost of sequencing DNA, again, you would know that better than I, has decreased dramatically over the past few years. Uh, it's be becoming cheaper and cheaper. Same with the offshore winds, to be fair. Uh, 10 years ago, it was 70% higher cost to actually set up the offshore wind farm. So there's a lot happening. And that is, if you make it simpler, um, that is the Anthropocene Ocean. So that's the reality of it. This is what we are trying to describe, which is a new ocean reality. We've used the ocean for millennium, but never to the extent and with the intensity that we're doing today. Of course, the problem is it can also look like that, the Anthropocene Ocean. So this is a dead zone in Rio de Janeiro, million of individual fish dead, no oxygen in the water. And this was just before the Olympics in 2016. This is bleached coral race in Belize. This is the stomach content of a black-footed albatross in Hawaii, full of plastic, suffocated, thinking it was food. This is a hammerhead chair caught as bycatch in, in some fishing net. So there are multiple pressure <clears throat> on the ocean from nutrients, dead zones, Climate change, of course, uh, acidification, overfishing, invasive spaces, increasingly habitat destruction, and so on. So as much as you have a blue acceleration in the use of the ocean, <clears throat> unfortunately, you also have a similar trend in some of those impacts. Um, this is the percent loss of mangrove forests over the years, the percent loss of coral reefs, the number of whale strikes, like shipping with megafauna strikes, the number of dead zones also skyrocketing due to pollution. A graph you're very familiar with, most likely, is the increasing overfishing happening in the, in the seafood sector over the years. It's up now to 34% of large industrial fisheries that are considered overfished um, and, and under less than 10% that is underfished, meaning with potential to expand. Another growth, it's marine heat wave um, increasing in terms of their intensity and their frequency. This was a graph just a few days ago uh, published by Nature 2023 is on track to be the warmest ever recorded year uh, when it comes to sea surface temperature. It's a really dramatic pattern there. It's warming much faster in the Arctic than anywhere else and faster than even some of the uh, modeling and projection had anticipated. Another one is the sounds. 
what about the noise? What about all those activities that are taking place? More boats, more platform, more rigs, more drilling, more offshore wind, and more sonars, uh, more mining potentially at the bottom, more dredging certainly. So um, that, that will have and is starting to have severe consequences on, on marine fauna in particular. And this one is, is one of my recent favorites. Uh, we, we published a report last week on it about the notion of sand and, and how we're using like the role of the dredging industry in the ocean economy. This is Eco-Atlantic City in Nigeria. This is 91 million cubic meter of sand that have been pumped from the seabed used to create this extension, artificial islands. This is the most expensive real estate in the entire continent of Africa, the square meter sells for $1,700 and it's all artificial and built at the expense of local communities. What you see over there, we're moving from Nigeria to the Maldives. This is a Google Earth screenshot of my computer in 2006. This is the same screenshot, but in 2019 with the timeline, um, an atoll was wiped out, replaced by a runaway. Uh, what you're seeing here is April 2019, a turtle actually laying eggs on the airstrip because those green turtles and endangered species um, are known to come back to their nesting sites. They always come back to the same beach where they were uh, born themselves. It's like kind of wired in um, based on magnetic fields. So they come back uh, and lay eggs. This is what happened when by the time it came back, the, the mangroves and the beach had disappeared and it was a runaway and he died a few days after that. A very powerful illustration, again, of what, what that means to actually extend uh, land. A recent study showed 78% of coastal cities uh, with more than 1 million inhabitants have used land reclamation in the past 20 years in terms of extension. It's, it's really dominant. It's not just China. It's not just out there. We have it uh, in France as well. We have it in UK, we have it in the Netherlands, the Netherlands was built like that. So a lot of, of impacts there as city with that. Um, globally, this was a synthesis by Ben Halpern and others in, in 2019. Clearly an update of the 2008 paper about the ocean health index showing, well, you know, human impact is becoming ubiquitous, pervasive, and it's increasing. Um, the more red, the more human impacts. And you can see the Mediterranean Sea here, you can't do it that good. Uh, and, and it's spreading all over the place, of course. So this is where I come in as a researcher and being like, okay, so how do we make sense of that new reality? That what, how do you actually approach it um, from a sustainability perspective in, in particular, which is my, my line of research. And the first thing we push for is kind of a shift in mindset on how we perceive sustainability. So the conventional view of sustainability, if maybe you, you've seen it in some of your textbook, I surely saw it no long, not as long as just a few years back in, in some lectures. It's like, well, it, you know, it's the intersection of the environment, the society, and the economy. There you go. There is your sustainability. Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's really fundamental to flip that over and to realize that the environment is actually the foundation within which uh, the society is embedded and the economy is embedded within the, the society. In other words, you, like, you don't have a functioning economy if you don't have a functioning society. And that clearly was illustrated over the past few years uh, with COVID-19. And the message is you don't have a functioning society if you don't have a functioning biosphere. And, and it, it seems like just a mental trick, but it's actually fundamental and almost philosophical, differently, different view of, of looking at the world and in that context in the ocean. Um, you can plot the SDGs on that and it, it matches pretty well. So you have four foundational SDGs. One of them is life below water, SDG 14. These are the foundation under and on top of which the other SDG can actually be mapped, whether it's, you know, Somewhere there's growth there. They decided to put growth in the SDG. Well, that's at the very top, right? Like if you want to have any kind of growth, whether you should or not, it's a different discussion on a different day. But then you need this foundation. You need that, that biosphere foundation in a good state. Um, one way we look at it also, and, and that's really how I approach most of my work, is to realize that changes in marine ecosystem dynamics um, are influenced by proximate 
uh, drivers, and, and you know that would be like fishing or pollution or nutrients, like having a direct direct impact onto your ecosystem. But those activities and those biophysical change are themselves embedded in a much broader and distal socioeconomic context, and, and that's going to be things you know like trade and finance, human migration, of course, governance. And so you're going to have those kind of distal drivers of change that interact with your proximate one, but also have influences straight down to the ecosystem. And so the idea is how do we how do we tease out those, right? So how do we try to identify in your system where to act? Are you acting here at the fishing level, or are you acting in what create the incentives for fishing, for instance, in the first place? Uh, think subsidies. It's a very hot topic. A few months ago, the World Trade Organization finally agreed. Uh, now we need countries to ratify it, but finally agreed in principle to put an end to um, overfishing subsidies, overcapacity. So like public subsidies, financing overcapacity and overfishing. And then, so if you, if you take those lenses of like the, the hierarchy of economy, society and, and biosphere, and then like this understanding of more telecoupling across drivers, and then apply it to the ocean to the blue acceleration that I showed you before. The question is how do we um, how do we make sense of it? And I've just highlighted four aspects. We could dive into many more, but first it's the notion of risk. Um, right now, if you think ocean risk <clears throat> in, in most of the literature and in most of stakeholder mind, it's going to be sea level rise or storm surges or flood. That's going to be those biophysical hazards hitting coastal communities or hitting the coast. I think what the blue acceleration shows you and what a system thinking lens shows you is that ocean risk is multidimensional. It's not just biophysical hazards, but it's also social, it's also geopolitical tension. The maritime space is really strongly geopolitical and certainly as well financial dimension. And of course, those risks interact with each other. All right, so this is adapted from a, a paper called, called Anthropocene Risk that really try to redefine the um, interaction of hazard, vulnerability, and exposure, which is often the framework used to, to capture risk, but put it into an Anthropocene context and saying, well, you know, exposure and vulnerability, the way they interact has changed because of that hyperconnectivity uh, of the Anthropocene, where everything is connected, everything is going so fast, and it's not just environmental, it's also social. Um, and of course, the baseline of hazards is also changing. And that's what we see with a lot of the storm surges, like what we thought was the baseline is actually constantly moving. There's also interactions. So again, think of all those curves going up through the sky. Um, that's as many people, industries, sectors, governance in the same space. So as the ocean space becomes more crowded, you have more interaction between sectors and you have more conflict between sectors. This is a tentative diagram uh, from a, a paper entitled Sharing the Seas that tries to review the literature for every possible interaction that is documented between sectors, which is that was led by Beatrice Krona. And then we identify those ocean sectors and then mediating activities that facilitate them. Um, eco is for ecosystem and NPA is for marine protected areas. And you can see how they are at the center and core of a lot of those interactions. A real world example of that, well, I, I I come from Stockholm, so I'm just looking at the other side, at Norway. This is the southern tip of Norway, the, the Skagerrak management area. It's among the world's most heavily trafficked region uh, in terms of boats and traffic. The seabed, it's not just oil and gas, it's also minerals. It's one major uh, fishing ground with cod, among others. It's an agriculture hotspot for salmon farming. It is also a, a cruise tourism destination. Any one of you have seen photos of <clears throat> Norwegian fjords. A lot of them are down there. Now, each one of those sectors in isolation are projected for like fivefold, sixfold, four times increase over the next coming years. So the salmon industry tells you, yep, we'll, we'll increase fivefold by 2050. Um, cruise visitor is also saying, absolutely, fivefold by 2030. Offshore wind capacity is growing in the region, and so on. And that leads to two things. That leads to two types of conflict. User-user <clears throat> conflicts, which is how one sector is interacting with another sector and, and conflicting with it. So you can't do bottom trolling where you have submarine cables and pipelines. It's not going to work. Um, but you also have user environment conflict, 
And that's going to be how the activity of one sector will impact on the environment and therefore, in turn, hinder another sector. Um, think of the um, Deepwater Horizon accident in 2010, the BP Deepwater Horizon, the oil platform that blew up in the Gulf of Mexico. From one day to another, the entire shrimp fishing industry disappeared overnight. It was one of the most profitable. It was well managed. They were fishing shrimp. Gone. There was so much oil that they had to shut down, right? That's the user environment type of conflict example. And there are plenty of those developing. Limits, that's the one that comes to mind when you see you that blue acceleration. You're like, well, how long and how far can it grow, right? 51,000 person growth over 20 years, what's next? Um, and so, of course, some of those resources, of course, are not infinite. This is what I briefly mentioned earlier. This is offshore oil and gas production um, over time and across depth. And what you're seeing, which is really fascinating, is that in shallow water, it has already started stagnating and decreasing. We're depleting those shallow water fields. So what did we do? Well, we moved to deep water all the way to 1,500 meters. And guess what? <laughs> it's starting to decrease as well. Um, so we're now all the way here because technology allow it, doing ultra deep water. Total, oh, total energies, because they changed their name, is, uh, is, is pioneering some of that technology offshore to go even deeper and deeper. So this is really kind of a, the production is sequentially moving towards greater depth because new technologies are emerging and, and because shallow water fields are depleting or starting to stagnate. And that's like finite resource, but you have another type of limits, which would be like, um, you know, emergent risk. No one in the cruise industry <laughs> would have thought about that. So this is June 2020. It's just a few weeks after the start, the two months, in fact, after the start of the pandemic. These are brand new cruise tourism vessels. You can still see the swimming pool and the mini golf on there. There's absolutely no reason to send them to Turkey to be dismantled and breaking down, except that it costs so much to keep them afloat if there is no passenger. And, of, and the cruise industry is an industry, it's one of the graph on the blue acceleration. So the blue acceleration stops in 2020, so it was before, um, before the, it was 2019 data for the cruise. And, and the limiting resources there was the, the pace at which they could build new boats. So there was so much demand that they couldn't actually manufacture cruise vessels enough to satisfy the demand. So that was the limits the industry had. Well, again, within a matter of week, it completely changed. They were sending to scrap those vessels because there was no more um, passenger. And last, but certainly not least, in the context of that race to the ocean is, is the notion of justice, fairness, and equity. Um, if you think of the blue acceleration as a race to the ocean, as like some kind of scramble for the seas, like everyone rushing for what they can grab, well, then there is really serious concerns about systemic inequity. The question is, well, if it's a race, who's racing um, and who's not winning that race? Like who's left behind? Um, and, and that's something we, we see uh, really strongly. If you look at small island developing states, so like seeds, and LDCs stand for least developed countries. So the poorest and the smallest of the countries with the coast. Um, they account for roughly 1.7% of, of global GDP population. It's, it's close to one tenth of global population. So it's, it's a lot of people. Now it's close to 20% of actually global coastline. If you look at EEZ, that's 23%. So they are major player, major nation. There's this very famous quote by Ronald Jumo, who was at the time the Seychelles ambassador to the UN, saying, you know, we're not a small island state, we're a large ocean nation. That's like, you know, look at us from an ocean perspective. We're big. I think the Cook Islands, it's 1,500 times the, the, the ocean surface is 1,500 times their land mass surfaces. So they are made mostly of water, if you like to think about it. Now, what do you think the blue acceleration looks for those guys down there? If we scale down the blue acceleration at a country level, to keep in mind the numbers I told you, right? 50,000 person growth and stuff like that. Here you are. Offshore wind farm, 0%. 
And those countries are heavily dependent on, on fossil fuel imports for their energy, right? So the offshore wind would be the no brainer. It would be like, yes, make use of that. Build that independence. Zero percent out of those uh, 51,000 person growth increase. Marine genetic resources, I told you 13,000 sequences patented uh, over the past 30 years. 0.03% were actually from institution headquartered uh, in those countries. Marine aquaculture, the world's fastest food production sector. Um, so aquaculture and marine aquaculture are part of that. Well, 0.09% of the global production, which now is, by the way, half-half with wild capture, right? So we're, we're producing as much farmed as we're fishing globally. Uh, well, 0.09% there. And then shipping, 7.3%, you're like, okay, they're getting there. But that's an artifact of Singapore being, for some reason, considered a small island developing state. If you remove Singapore from that equation, that's less than 1% of global maritime transport, right? So you think, I think you got my point. Uh, there is a lot of blue economy narrative. The EU, among other, is using blue synonymously with ocean. Uh, which is something I try to make a distinction in my work, where ocean economy is the sum of the economic activities taking place in the ocean. A blue economy is very much an aspirational one that, that inherently would be sustainable and equitable. Um, and we're not there at all. We, we're, we're not there at all. Um, and this is just illustration of how that aspect on equity is picking up across a wide range of sectors, right? It's not just about fishing. Uh, we looked at it with colleagues in, in the biotech industry and, and the gene patenting, among other um, ocean grabbing. We talked about it as well. So it's, it's, it's gaining prominence. And it's, it's gaining prominence to the fact that you're like, yes, so an inclusive governance of the blue economy can only work with partnership, right? It can only work if you have government, if you have private sector and you have civil society working together. Um, and a big chunk of my work, which I started already during the PhD was to try to focus on the private sector in particular and try to understand what's the role uh, of seafood industry, the seafood companies, and I'll get back to that. So if you think private sector and then you think the ocean, the question is, again, there's this blue acceleration, there's this race, who is racing from the private sector? Um, and we looked at that in, in a paper led by John Girdin at Duke University, where we tried to map the 100 largest um, ocean companies and, and using the OECD categories of ocean-based industries, like eight ocean-based industries as classified by the OECD. And that's what it looks like. So this is your ocean, this is your different ocean-based industries um, with their total revenues, and this is how much the top 10 companies in that sector account for the global market share. So if I take 10 oil and gas companies, they account for more than half of all revenues from offshore oil and gas. Now, if I take 10 of the container shipping companies, they control 85% of the market share. I take 10 of the cruise tourism, it's 93%. In fact, cruise tourism is funny because if you take only three companies in the world, it's 84%. So you have three CEOs sitting somewhere. They actually sit in Florida um, and they control the three of them and they control 84% of the market share of cruise tourism. Um, but they are not incorporated in Florida because they would have to pay taxes. So they are actually incorporated in Belize, Panama and Liberia, um, which means that when COVID-19 hit, the US government bailed out those three companies with taxpayer money, even though they have never had paid a single tax in US soil. So overall, top 10 firms typically make up over half of an industry revenue on average across the ocean economy. Now, if you look past just those eight different ocean sectors, you just take their revenues and you look at the top 100 companies. So what does the corporate landscape of the ocean economy look like? Uh, you can't really see the distinction of the color very well, but it's a lot of black. And black stands for offshore oil and gas. So if you look at 100 largest companies in the ocean today by revenue, 47 of them are oil and gas companies. Uh, top 10, nine are oil and gas companies. All those guys at the start of the graph. Um, so you, you, you do have a very big discrepancy between the narrative of the blue economy and the actual reality of current extraction from the ocean that we're seeing. 
Um, 100 companies, 60% of the total value of the ocean economy captured in their turnover and in their revenues. Who are they? You will know some of them, like the oil and gas, it's the usual suspect. You recognize them. Uh, and then a lot that you probably have never heard of because they don't have brand exposure. They're just out there doing the job, but there's no real leverage from a consumer perspective on those companies. Where are they? This is what it looks like. So 100 companies, 38 countries, this is where the revenues are going. Um, you see a pattern like you see, you see Brazil, so well, Middle East, this is a bias from the oil and gas sector. You remove those 47 companies of the oil and gas sector, you recompile the list, uh, it looks like that. That's your ocean economy today. So US, Europe, China, Japan, South Korea, that's it. That's where the revenues are flowing. So we published that paper um, and it was picked up by Peter Thompson, who's the UN Special Envoy uh, for, at the United Nations, Special Envoy for the Ocean. And he, he authored an op-ed called What Can Corporation Do to Help Save the Ocean? And he was really like using the paper as a call to action saying, well, you know, here they are, they have such a strong responsibility, they're using the ocean, therefore they should uh, take a leadership role, they should play a major role in climate and ocean action. I don't know about you, I get a little bit unsettled when I get that title here. So the first thing that comes to mind is like pay taxes, but I couldn't really say that. So um, then I'm a sustainability scientist. So I'm like, all right, all right. So what can corporation and scientists at least do together um, to help save the ocean? And, and that, to be honest, uh, it really speaks to sustainability science, right? And how it's been defined. Um, those are quotes from Robert Cates, um, who published just a decade ago, a, a paper on what kind of system of science is sustainability science. And it was, it was described as a different kind of science that is primarily use inspired and really about moving knowledge into societal action, right? And that it's actual test of success. How do you know whether sustainable science will succeed is whether it can actually implement the knowledge it creates um, to, to meet and to solve the environmental challenges that we're, we're facing. And in that sense, I think scientists uh, have a critical role to, to play that bridge between knowledge and action, and uh, not to remain in their ivory towers, publishing papers and feeling good way if they are cited. Most of the time they are not, but to actually really try to translate and engage, right? It's the whole notion of scientists as, as change makers. And again, bear with me, I talk about sustainability scientists. This is not saying that every single scientist in every discipline has to do that. But I think in the field of sustainability, this is really the direction that the field is taking is to have that societal engagement. Mm -hmm. It's often described as interdisciplinary, which is like synthesizing knowledge from multiple disciplines. Um, the, the place I work is a good example of that. I sit next to economists, I sit, and sit next to um, political scientists, uh, but originally it comes from ecology. The Stockholm Resilience Center was founded by a bunch of, of renegade ecologists that wanted a bit more social dimension to their work. Um, but it's not just interdisciplinary, it has to be transdisciplinary. And by that, I mean, it's, going, it's moving beyond academia. So it's not just remaining within academic disciplines, but it's really moving beyond academia to engage with societal actors. And those societal actors can be government, they can be NGOs, indigenous communities, but they can also be the private sector. And that's, that's what I've been looking at. Uh, for instance, in that initiative, the Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship, where we identify and targeted the largest seafood companies in the world, the biggest you can think of in terms of revenues. Um, and try to engage in a dialogue with them. So we have 10 companies around the table right now. Those are the names. Um, and together, so it's 10 companies. They operate in more than 95 countries. They have more than 600 subsidiaries, 250,000 employees, just 10 companies. They handle and process and procure and sell more than 400 different spaces. 
and then they control large share of, of different stocks and, and both aquaculture, fishing and fish meal and fish oil, like the aqua feeds, the feeds for the aquaculture. Process of engagement, it's just an example, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's been a series of dialogues. So it started by identifying those companies, uh, drawing an analogy, or not an analogy, but an inspiration from keystone species in the environment, looking at them as keystone actors, potentially in their industry, and then engaging them and trying to convince them to join the very first dialogue. Um, we just foresee, we were four scientists, four of us, and then the CEOs of the companies. And, and key there was at the CEO level, we said no one else than CEOs. We want to go to the, to the very top of the companies. Um, and that gave birth to the initiative. Um, CBOS came out of that first dialogue and successively over the years, a model of two meetings per year, one at the CEO level, one at the kind of operational staff within the companies, trying to move on on a set of commitments. So the initiative is organized around six task forces that try to address some of the most pressing challenges faced by the industry. It resulted in time-bound goals where the companies were like quantifying targets and, and the saying by when they would actually um, solve it. They've got a lot of good press for doing that and for engaging in that it was perceived as potentially transformative. And there's been a lot of learnings from us as well, um, including the importance of trust, of establishing trust early on in the process with those individuals. Um, the recognition that learning is multidirectional, so it's not just scientists to companies. Um, there's, of course, learning from real world problems from some business to scientists, but it's also across companies, right? So like peer learning, because those companies are different stage of their sustainability journey. So there's a lot of cross fertilization there. Um, it's finally starting to generate results after a couple of years. We can talk more about that later and, and to inspire other initiatives as well. But <laughs> it remains an experiment. And by that, I mean that this is really how we perceive it, is that we're testing a hypothesis, which is that because they are so big, they could actually have a cascading effect throughout the entire sector. Whether that's the case or not, um, we don't know yet. In June at the UN Ocean Conference, they released their first progress report, a five years progress report, what have we done? Um, and then on parallel, we are documenting it with a series of, of peer-reviewed scientific articles led by Henry Kostablum, who has been spearheading that effort. And that kind of document, okay, how did we do it? What worked, what doesn't work, where are we now? And that's still a work in progress. Now, if I move back to this one, um, I mean, you can tweak that forever. You can have a lot of fun with a title like that. So uh, another part of my work, and I'll, I'll wrap up with that aspect, um, is came from the realization that companies were telling you, well, it all sounds good. We're convinced it's the right thing to do. But at the end of the day, we need to show profits to our shareholders. And actually, not at the end of the day, but the, of the, the end of the quarter. Right, so that's what we did. We need to show profit to our shareholders. So it's not in our hands. So it's like, well, great. Then let's go to the shareholders. Um, you know, like what can finance do to help corporations? Like, how can finance actually create incentives for companies to do things differently? And their finance. I mean, finance is a big word. There's there's a lot into finance, right? And they're very different type of finance. Take the SDGs, for instance. Can you spot SDG 14? That's right. <laughs> there it is. So SDG 14, life below water, one of the foundational one I showed you on the wedding cake type of graph. Um, it's the least finance goal of all. If you take the period 2015 to 2019, it's barely making it at $10 billion. Well, estimates shows that if we are to achieve the targets within SDG 14 only, you need $175 billion a year. Here, it's a four year period cumulative not reaching 10 billion. So big finance gap, like big ocean finance gap when it comes to financing sustainable activities. Likewise, in the last 10 years, less than 1% of the total value of the ocean has been invested in sustainable projects through philanthropy and official development assistance. And that's the narrative of the ocean finance gap, like that you hear a lot. Uh, it's pushed by impact investment, by development bank, by NGOs and by financiers themselves. Like we need, you know, we need more investment in the ocean, more sustainable investment. It's, it's perceived as risky. No one dared to go there. 
Sure, but then you have the blue acceleration and all those sectors require capital, right? So you have money flowing like crazy into those sectors, like trillions of dollars that are actually funneled by banks and others into the ocean economy. It's just that it's not tagged with any sustainability metrics. So we said, okay, forget about impact investment and let's look at mainstream finance, like traditional finance. Uh, what do we have in terms of intervention points where we can act? Well, you have banks, you have stock exchanges, and you have shareholders. Banks, they're really interesting because they are the they are accounts for the majority of external finance the company receives. So if you want to build a fishing boat, you're going to go to a bank and ask for a loan. Uh, if you want to build a new factory or a finance an offshore wind farm, you're going to go to a bank. And the bank will tell you, yep, and well, I give you the money. Here's a covenant. Here's a contract between you and me that tells you what to do to get that money. And most of those are based on a financial requirement, right? You need to show some financial requirement to get access. But you have something called sustainability linked loans where the interest rate of that loan is actually linked to the sustainability performance of the company. An example here would be a shipping company in Japan, you know, half a billion dollar loans for which the interest rate is adjusted to the company's response to climate change as measured in a reduction, in a, in a re reduction of absolute carbon emissions. So the more they lower their emissions, the more um, friendly the interest rate is. So the lower the interest rate is creating an economic incentives. This is in the seafood sector, same principle associated with onboard monitoring of fishing vessels. So the, they need the obligation of setting up electronic monitoring on board of the vessels, traceability through the supply chain, and then they get access to the capital. And the good news is it's picking up rapidly. So that type of financial loans is really picking up. And so it's promising. Now what's missing on that graph is the rest of the loans, which wouldn't fit in that room, wouldn't fit in that building even. So the issue is that it looks good, but it still accounts for a tiny fraction of the global loan markets. So it remains the exception. Stock exchanges, that's where you go uh, if you want to become publicly listed. So like to open your shares to the public. Um, so I'm a company, I want more exposure, I want to raise capital, I'm private, I'm going to go public. So I'm going to do an initial public offering. And I need to be listed on a stock exchange, Paris, Tokyo, um, Wall Street, like New York Stock Exchange, the World Trade Center was that. Um, and there you have listing requirement. Each one of those stock exchanges has listing requirement that tells you what you need to do if you want to get listed. Again, it's mostly financial but you have the opportunity to change those listing requirements to start taking system team into consideration. So you could have stock exchanges saying, well, if you want to be listed on the Paris Stock Exchange, you have to have a system of your report, you have to disclose your supply chain and so on. Why it's interesting in seafood, because if you look at the largest publicly listed seafood companies, they are all listed on the same stock exchanges. So like just four stock exchanges, concentrate 86% of the revenues of those seafood companies. So if you were to change the listing requirements of Tokyo, Oslo, Korea, and Thailand, you could have a really transformative impact on how publicly listed seafood companies have to deal with sustainability. The asterisk shows you that out of the four, it's only Thailand that has some kind of sustainability consideration as of today at all. And I think it's published a sustainability report, so the bar is pretty low. Um, Tokyo alone, it's 53% of the whole market. So um, this is my one before last slide. It's to say that why would financiers do it? Why would banks do it? Why would stock exchanges do it? They're not going to do it out of altruism, unfortunately. And so you need a regulatory push. You need a regulatory landscape that is actually creating the incentives for those actors to themselves create the incentives for the companies to do things differently. And you're starting to see a little bit of that. You may have heard of the EU taxonomy, which is a, a mammoth effort to try to define what is sustainable and what isn't. It managed to piss off everyone, both on the industry and on the science or conservation side, because it's not good enough for not, neither of them. But it's an effort in the right direction. So speaking of stock exchange, you have the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative which is trying to engage with stock markets to do that, exactly that. And then a bunch of different framework and standards to try to understand how company operation impacts nature and how they can report on it. This is the final one. And it's, and it's a very simple take home message. It's that I think the, the point here is that 
I don't think any single one of those actors in isolation can actually create the change to the scale that we need. Like engaging with companies, it's not going to make it. Uh, engaging with governments or trusting governments to do it, that's pretty much what we've done over the past 30, 40, 50 years, and we're still not where we want to be. Um, so this is true beyond the ocean, to be fair, but, but for the sake of today, let's put it in the ocean. But accelerating ocean system and equity really requires that collaborative and political effort across the entire value chain. So you need consumer awareness, you need regulators and policymakers engaged. Of course, you need the business side involved, um, but it has to be at the same time. It's not an exclusion of each other. It's collectively that you can try to, to push it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think it's not specific to the ocean. You could question that for the entire global economy uh, to some extent. And so that's a bit of a problem. It's like there is so much we can do on a sector based. At the end, there is a the current economy we're living in uh, is really not creating the incentives for that transformational change. You, you have sectors that have more incentives if you take seafood it's a renewable resource. So they, there really is very strong incentive to actually manage it in a good way and do it properly. And even there, we're struggling, right? Because there is this quarterly shareholder report. What you're seeing is, is kind of an extractivism mentality 
of sequential exploitation where you're going to fish as much as you can for as long as you can. And where there's no more fish, you move to a different stock or you move to a different species. So in the seafood industry, you see a lot of the traditional historical large fishing companies that are investing massively in farming right now and transferring because they have the legacy of knowing the decrease in population. Now, oil and gas, it's much harder like, to even have that discussion because it's, a, it's about leaving it in the ground, right? Like do not, don't drill it, like don't get out, just leave it there. And, and we're saying that it's not the case. So in principle, I completely agree with you. In practice, I have not seen it because not the will of individuals necessarily, but the broader system within, those, within which those companies are embedded in. So, um, so you can hear me, looks like. Uh, so thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. It was great to to hear all of that. Um, so, but somehow what you showed, it's that the problem is a capitalism problem. It's not a, 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 human, a human problem. So your talk was entitled the, Ant the Anthropocene Ocean. So why didn't you called it uh, the Capitalocene Ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, again, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I'm, I'm not using Capitalocene in my work. I'm, I'm more grounded into the Anthropocene. Like, I mean, the Anthropocene itself um, is a very debated word, right? Like you have people getting very angry at using it. You have a lot of scientists trying to push it as a geological epoch, uh, like on par with Holocene, and then equally angry and motivated scientists to prevent that from happening. Um, for me, and it goes, it goes, it's aligned with what you said. Um, I don't really care whether it's a geological epoch per se, or an period or an era. They are like debating about that as well. Uh, I use it as an analytical framework. So I use the notion of the Anthropocene as an analytical framework to try to unpack and make sense of the dynamics that we're observing. Um, and in that sense, without the without having providing the answer in the question already, which would be if I was using capitalocene as an analytical framework, because then you know exactly what's at stake. So there's a lot of aspects of that that are definitely related to capitalism uh, as, a, as an economic paradigm. But, but for my work, and I think for the sake of bringing stakeholders around the table, there is value in, in having Anthropocene rather than grounding it into a single economic model. And so that's why I don't use Capitalocene personally. You have Plastocene as well. So you, this, this kind of Anthropocene has been declined in many ways, depending on what you're interested in, right? So people working a lot with plastics are using actually in the literature, the term Plastocene to show that yes, it's the era where plastic is absolutely everywhere. Um, from an economic perspective, you can have Capitalocene, you could have Corpocene as well with the domination, which is also in the literature, with the domination of large uh, transnational cooperation on the economy. Um, so maybe for a different talk, not today, but it's a good point. Thank you very much. Uh, a, a, a nice uh, 
article about biodiversity conservation, and then right next to it, uh, an article about these cool scientists who are developing a new method of drilling oil in the upper <laughs> below the sea. Now. So, do you have anything to do? Anything you could you could you could do here? Okay, the level of question is getting higher and higher here to answer. <laughs> this, is, this is becoming more and more challenging. Um, but I mean, the first thing that came to my mind when I heard you was like technocene, boom, another one of this kind of capitalocene, technocene. As you said, right, there's, there's like this trust in what well, technology will solve it. So let's keep going as we do. Um, now to your much harder question about why don't scientists see that it, I don't know if I have a good answer. I think, you know, scientists, it's like finance. You say, oh, finance can solve it. Finance means everything and nothing at the same time. And I think scientists are also super heterogeneous. Like a lot of the talk here, and I, I, I made that point, it's, it's through the lens of sustainability science, right? Because sustainability science has that mandate to actually try to ensure a, a, a livable planet for, for future generation in a, in a large extent. Yes, some of those companies have an army of scientists on board. Uh, you know, they, they have, the first time I met with one of the seafood companies, uh, I was doing my PhD and she's like, oh yeah, we just hired 70 PhD. That was the company, right? Hiring a mass, for, a mass workforce of 70 different brilliant people working on aquaculture innovation, feeds and things like that. So. I don't have an answer, I'm afraid. Uh, I think it, it goes back to education. So it goes back to kind of really the whole societal model uh, and what, what we are after. And right now, again, there is a given economic paradigm, there is this quest for growth as well, um, which is kind of formatting in a large extent how, how people and where investment in research are being made. Um, you could think of finance for research and have redirecting a bit of that financing towards different um, disciplines that desperately need it, but ultimately it's a, it, yeah, it's an individual choice. I, I don't know, I don't know what to tell those scientists. Um, and 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 now also, not nothing is black or white, right? Like the way the way I'm talking now, the way we're living, the way we're moving, your smartphone in your pocket it comes from scientists that probably didn't think much about sustainability when they designed some of those. So it's not as easy as saying let's get rid of corporation and and scientists working in oil and gas. Um, what you do see in the oil and gas industry, and that's a fun fact, is that they are struggling, increasingly struggling to actually hire uh, talents uh, in the pipelines. Uh, and and this, this is pretty interesting. So, you know, it used to be the, the one place you, want, you would like to make a career, and there are, that has shifted. And, and from their own admission, they are, they are the ones saying it, saying, you know, we're, we don't recruit. And it's really, it's really so maybe, maybe there there is a shift. Okay, so we now have a question online by Xavier Cousin. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I, I wrote the detailed question on the uh, question and answer box, but the, the idea was uh, to take the example of the um, second round of negotiation uh, on the treaty to resolve plastic pollution, which will, uh, which will come soon. And uh, my question whether the, in this case, the US position is quite uh, lukewarm. And uh, so my question was, what is the US position on uh, the issues you mentioned? And the same question arises for China. And in, in both cases, as countries or government first, and as a, a place where are, where are based uh, main economic actors, as you mentioned. Yeah, well, very tough as well. So you, you said US, right? It was US. Yeah, yeah. Yes. US and China, yeah. US and China. Whew, where to start? <laughs> um, the US, I mean, well, first you have the election cycle in US, right? We're, we're, we came after four years of uh, the Trump administration that really did massive damage to some of the institutions, scientific institution, and even the vision of the country. The Biden administration came in, there was a lot of hopes, there was some motion, some action going in the right direction, but full of contradiction as well. Uh, so I'm not that surprised that they are lukewarm uh, when it comes to the plastic, because the biggest plastic producers are headquartered in US. Um, and you know, just as a few weeks ago, the Biden administration allowed drilling in the Arctic for oil and gas. And in terms of administration, it's one of the administration that issued 
uh, most licenses um, in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So in terms of oil and gas, so there is a lot of contradiction there um, in the US, but it's much better than it was a few years ago. So maybe that's the half-half way to look at it. Um, China is, is also really difficult to, to address, I think, because they have really strong economic power. Um, a lot of the companies that are dominating some of those sectors are Chinese. Um, and they are state-owned, right? So it's also a different type of companies. It's not your usual private sector. You ultimately deal with with the political, with the with the Chinese regime and and the government there. Um, and so there, like, very little leverage. Um, but on the bright side, if they decide to change, it will change much faster than anywhere else in the world. And we've seen that in China with air pollution, for instance, not necessarily out of um, uh, environmental concern, but first and foremost, health concern. So when, you know, they had to close schools because they couldn't breathe any longer in Beijing, then you had policies in place to completely transform that. And you now see blue sky again in Beijing and, and you can breathe out. So that's the hope with China is that they have an ambitious plan and they have the means um, to implement it really quickly. Um, but we're not seeing that quite yet, I think. So two very difficult i mean you you didn't pick the easiest country right like usa and china really hard very big economic forces and on top of that i think geopolitical tensions as well um so you know and you see it with the war in ukraine for instance when you have those events taking place then environmental consideration are going to the background i think and not to the forefront and that's exactly what you see in terms of contradiction within Countries. Um, I wish you had asked me about France. <laughs> okay, uh, we are a bit late, so we will take two last questions, but uh, please be short in questions and answers. I, I wanted to say a, a, a quick comment first. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, it's the first time we have a sustainability science talk at the same, and I am so happy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that you came to do the first one uh, and um, that you did this uh, brilliant talk. As uh, Fred, I am a little bit uh, depressed now. <laughs> so I prefer to ask my question on the solution. And uh, Remy talked about the problem of capitalism. And you, in the solution you provided, it's more like a tuning of the capitalist system. Mm. Are you aware of work in uh, economy, uh, 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 and more in particular in degrowth economy in the ocean? Do, mm. Are you aware of people uh, thinking about how we, rather than to uncouple growth, economical growth, and uh, ecology, uh, you could have the objective of degrowth? Yeah, that's uh, so. First, fully agree. We're we're talking like band aids to like an emoji or a cancer, right? In in crude terms, um, the rationale though to put those band aids is that it's still better than just sitting and watching it burn and 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 hope for the best, but knowing that we're we're going down. Um, so it's incremental change. It's reformist, uh, probably as opposed to transformative. Ultimately, that's what we touched upon a little bit. If you want to be really transformational, you need to rethink the entire system. Um, I'm thinking Kate Rayworth and, and like the donut economy, for instance, her work on taking the planetary boundaries, but adding a social dimension to it as well. It's not just environmental, it's also well-being of people and, and decency of living. Then I'm thinking of uh, Timothée Parik work on degrowth. He was at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, doing his PhD when I was there as well. He's really one of the very strong voice and, and uh, in the French media, among other, um, on, on degrowth. Whether it's specific to the ocean, I'm not sure. And I, I'm not familiar with that literature. So I was cur genuinely curious. I was like, yeah, that's a really good point. So what would it look like to, to look at ocean and degrowth? I think there's been paper of specific sector. So for instance, you know, heavy minerals, sand extraction on coastal ecosystem, disastrous from an environmental and a social perspective. And then the question is, okay, so one thing is to put standards or certification or whatever. Another is just to stop using as much sand as, as we do. Uh, and that would be in line with that. So it's not so much framed as degrowth. I think it's framed as post-growth. So it's trying to imagine something beyond. 
a degrowth might be the way there, but not the end on its own. Um, and, and yeah, I think in the ocean, it hasn't been explored that much, uh, as far as I'm aware. So I don't want to make anyone angry if they have actually looked at it. It's just that I haven't come across it um, that much. What you see is seeds. So seeds of, like there's a whole project called Seeds of a Good Anthropocene, which is an online database that is um, collating uh, examples of place-based initiatives or efforts to actually do things differently with the hope that, yes, it's a seed, it's small scale, it's very local, but it has the potential to grow. And, and then the question is, how do you enable that growth? So from a seed to like a fully fully flown. So Seeds of the Grand Tropocene, if you have initiatives like that, please go check it out because you can contribute and input examples as well from, from your area or anywhere else. Um, so not specific on degrowth or post-growth, but also kind of looking to the other way, like what would be a desirable future as opposed to how do we tackle where we are now. Thanks. And so we will have now a last question online by Olivier Maury. Hi, hello. Thank you uh, very much, jean for your very interesting talk. Um, it, was, it was really a brilliant presentation. I've got a short question, uh, which is, uh, can a multinational company based on extractivism of most often non-renewable resources become sustainable? Uh, in other words, can you become sustainable when the really core of your activity is intrinsically not sustainable? Um, and, and do you think that big companies are ready to change uh, what they are when, when it is not profitable? Wow. <laughs> um, so full disclaimer, I do wake up at night thinking exactly about that because that's, that's underpinning a lot of the time I spent and the effort and uh, that we are putting into that specific initiative with seafood sector. Thinking, you know, every second day, are we actually going anywhere or is, is there anything coming out of that? Um, so I guess yes and no probably is, is the answer right now. Um, like the theory of change is because they are so big, they can influence the, rate, the rest of the industry, right? So the reason to targeting them, and that's the experiment, is to say they can set new industry norms. If, if they do it, then the industry will follow. Um, so that would be the kind, yes, they can change, uh, especially if they have incentives to do so. And that's where I'm going back to the thing that it's not just a company, like the company is not going to do it by waking up in the morning and feeling suddenly, oh, we could care about the resource. Um, and that's where I think regulation is so bloody important. Like a lot of what you're seeing in the corporate sustainability landscape is voluntary action. So it's those voluntary environmental programs. Companies coming together, CBOS is an example of that, it's purely voluntary, coming together, trying to address some problem. I don't think this will scale up unless it's regulated, unless it's part of an obligation for those companies. Companies didn't have to report on their financial, uh, you know, publicly listed companies in the 70s didn't have to produce a financial report. Well, today they do. You don't, you don't go along without a financial report if you're a publicly listed company. That's a regulation. So you, you can, there are examples of how regulation can shift things. Now, more deeply and philosophically, your question is, well, can companies solve a problem that they are the root cause of? And that I don't know. It's, it's a, it, and there is a whole critical social scientist literature that is really taking aim at some of our work with that exact question, saying, guys, you're, you're, you're targeting the wrong, the wrong people there because they are the cause of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, once you've said that, what do you do about it? Do you say, okay, no more companies gone? How does that look? How does that look for even like society today? So it's not that easy, right? So that's that's why it's uh, it's an unsettling question. And personally, I think it's worth the effort of at least testing it and trying it out uh, to see. And the final point is, if we don't, the risk is that sustainability has now become mainstream for companies, not necessarily in their action, but in their narrative. So there is a really tangible risk that sustainability is being hijacked by the private sector to kind of legitimate business as usual operation without any evidence-based or any scientific grounding that actually make a difference. So that's another way to look at it. You're like, yes, it probably won't be transformative as much as we need, 
um, like Nicola said. But it's still useful to try to ground it more into science than just pure greenwashing as like, oh yeah, we care about sustainability, but you know, there's no evidence base, there's no monitoring, there's no reporting framework, and there's no accountability. So I guess that's part of the motivation in doing that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I, I wish I, the discussion could have been longer. It's really fascinating. And so thank you again for coming here and for to the attendees for the questions. So it was really interesting. Thanks everyone. And thank you.